Well, I announced this uh, title of the sermon a few weeks ago. I didn't really, <laughs> I guess I wasn't expecting a lot of comments about it, uh, but it is kind of unusual. The title of the message is Say Shibboleth. Shibboleth is spelled S-H-I-B-B-O-L-E-T-H. Our text for this is Judges chapter 12. Let me give you some background to this, then we'll read our text, and I'll give you three points about what it means. I enjoy preaching from the book of Judges. Uh, it's in the interval of time when Israel was ruled by 13 judges over 305 years. There were some spaces in between there, obviously. Uh, one of them was a woman. The fourth judge was Deborah. It's kind of funny how that only position of a woman in leadership is picked up on so much today in churches. Uh, they have uh, the Deborah or something meetings and uh, evidence. Of, well, if Deborah could be a leader, ladies ought to be able to be deacons. And you'd be surprised the things that go on with that. But her and Barak were judges together and uh, seemed to have done a good job. Eighteen times in that 300 and five years, Israel backslid, turned away from God. God had to send judgment. That accounts for the 305 years because sometimes he left them alone for 20 or 30, I think in one instant, 40 years, didn't show himself to them. Uh, they just couldn't get it. Here they are with judges to rule over them, the law to live by, and yet they sinned again against God and it seemed like it was over and over. The last judge was Samson. There were 13 judges, and the last one was Samson. Our judge here is the ninth judge. His name is Japheth. Uh, he's in an era of time when there is a great division among the tribes, especially one tribe called Ephraim. And they had the center valley in all the land of Palestine, the center area was a, fru a fruitful uh, plain, and they controlled that area. And I think that might have affected them in some ways. And they were forever opposing the other tribes. This set up the eventual division of ten tribes and two tribes uh, under King Solomon and, and with his sons. And divided Israel even up in our day. The ten lost tribes were ten of those tribes. And it kind of started uh, with these folks and the things that they did. Uh, it eventually led to total rebellion and confusion. In fact, the whole end of the book of Judges, uh, I forget how many chapters there, uh, is all about after the Samson was gone. And Israel was full of, how did it call it? Uh, let's see what it was here. Uh, division and strife. Rebellion and confusion. Those two areas, rebellion, division, and strife, rebellion, and confusion led to this statement being made four times. And it came to pass that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's, that's division. Uh, the 12 tribes would not be unlike 50 states. Individual rule, yet collectively representative of Israel before God. And the strife came. You know, we, we have some of that in, in our country. It brought about a civil war, 13 colonies that pulled out uh, 13. I think one extra joined them. And it led to a civil war. Fortunately, in our lifetime, the strife among states, I think because of vacation possibilities and job transfers, Nobody's hardly ever. In fact, I'm I'm one of the few you'd know. I'm I'm a Colorado boy. Aside from maybe a couple other places, this is our whole life's been here, and uh, my most of my childhood uh, was here. So, uh, but still, there's there can be things that happen that bring strife among uh, the people. This uh, uh, the story of this encounter in our message begins at verse number six. We see it three times here. 
in uh, in Judges chapter 12, and uh, let's see, I, want, I don't know if I want to begin with that one. Uh, then said they unto him, this is uh, Ephraim, say now, or they said to Ephraim, say now Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, S-I-B-B. It had the H is not there. Sibboleth versus Shibboleth. And now watch this. For he could not frame to pronounce it. Let me tell you some examples of that in our country. We eat an avocado crunched up with jalapenos in it, and we call it You guys are really helpful. Isn't it called guacamole? Am I not got any of you here with me this morning? Does anybody here ever eat guacamole? Well, thanks. A couple of you woke up and joined me. I, I needed that illustration, but you didn't get it. Don't try saying that if you go to the East Coast. It's called guacamole, guacamole or guacacamole. I'll try an easier one. Maybe there's something else I could pick on. Uh, the difference in, in that threw me way off. You, you killed my introduction. People in Texas talk different than people in Colorado. People in Maine talk way different than anybody in the world. They pack their car. What? We park our car, thank you very much, but they pack the car. I lived out there in the service and I have to stop thinking about what they're talking about. That, that's kind of the division that's seen here that lost its whole emphasis. The, the identity for somebody from that other area was in the way they spoke. And so they used that. Now I'm going to tell you the background of the story a little bit. In chapter 12 and verse number 1, And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said to Jephthah, uh, Jephthah Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? We'll burn your houses upon thee with fire. And Japheth said, uh, Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon, and when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hand. And Ephraim was the large army. I forget, like 600,000 or something like that. And when I saw that you delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Uh, wherefore they are uh, then are wherefore then are you come up to me this day to fight against me? Well, the truth is, if you go back and read Judges, which was kind of fun, I haven't renewed my uh, relationship with the judges for some time. Ephraim did that two other times where they turned their back, and yet when they came at the one on the other side, they said, you never came to us. Twice in the scripture said they did, and twice Ephraim said, no, you didn't. Well, Ephraim is the one with the problem. Uh, and then verse 4, then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. Boy, there are a lot less men. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim, because they said, ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. Hard names, aren't it? All these names had an eye on the end of them. Even the judges had an eye on the end of them. You're familiar with Samson? Uh, his name is Samsonite. They named the luggage after him. I thought I'd tell you about it. I didn't expect you to get that any better than the guacamole. But anyway, here they are. They're having trouble with the, the name pronunciation. And so the Gileadites took the passage of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when the Ephraimites, the Ephraimites have left the valley, they've gone to attack Gilead, and they found out Gilead is meaner and tougher than they expected. So they're trying to get back to their country, to their state. Don't, don't say country to their state, and Gilead blocked the passage. They looked alike. They kind of even dressed alike. Down Texas way, they dress more cowboy-like than probably the Easterners do. We kind of do that up this way. Uh, so they're trying to corner them so they can take care of the problem. I mean, 
You've already said you're going to burn our houses. No, we're going to fix it so you don't burn anybody's houses. That's how drastic this is. So here we are. The Gileadites took the passage of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so that when these Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said to them, Art thou an Ephraimite? And he said, Nay, no, I am not. Well, they looked the same. They dressed the same. They were Jewish. They, they just wanted to kind of mingle with the crowd. They said, what are we going to do about this? Verse 6, Then said they unto him, any one man that passed by, Say now, Shibboleth. And he answered, Sibboleth. Watch it, underline it. For he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passage of Jordan. Now this sounds pretty meek, doesn't it? One man couldn't say Shibboleth. He said Sibboleth. And so they slew him by Jordan. Let's read the rest of the verse. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites, mark it down, 40 and 2,000. 40 and 2,000 Ephraimites died because they couldn't say Shibboleth. And so I got a kick out of that, and I thought, well, let's read the next verse. And Jephthah judged Israel six years, then he died. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Then it goes on and names the other judges. But when I got to looking at this, I thought, you know, in a lot of ways that presents a kind of a problem we have with 50 states. We're same, we're all of different nationalities, but we're all American. And it used to be anyone coming here wanted to be an American. Your folks came here. Uh, there's very few that are from here, unless you're Native American. Uh, they came here, they rode in a ship and went right in front of the Statue of Liberty, got out on that island. They had to study the Constitution. They had to learn the Pledge of Allegiance, learn the National Anthem. They had to do all kinds of things, and they all came together. I forget how many they could train at one time, three or four hundred. And they all had a little American flag, and they waved it. They were made to say certain things, and they were accepted into this country, and they became American. Now, granted, down south they can't say guacamole, and back east they can't say guacamole, and in Colorado they don't even know what guacamole is. It differs. I'm not going to let that one go. You know what we're having for dinner next, uh, next month? Guacamole. Um, I'm not going to let you make it go <laughs> if you don't know what it is. Uh, the, but the, there is an identifier. You can tell a lot. If you're from the south, you say y'all. If you're from the east, you say ka instead of car. If you're from out here, you say I'm hungry or I don't know what else the other words would be. But there's definitely a divider. And in churches that ought, and among Christians, that ought not be so. Uh, there, there's a slogan that we use here. We don't say it a whole lot, but I hope you at once in your life would be brought to a place to have to say this identifier for Ridgeview Baptist Church. What we do, we do together. That's a motto of this church. We have about eight or ten of those. They, do, we, they don't vary. One of the keys to a church is its, its ability to get along, its ability to do things together. So we could even take this problem at this level. I think I mentioned a few weeks ago, when I came here, I saw that in this church in ways I would have never believed if I hadn't have seen it in the minutes and watched it in the hallway of God's people treating each other like they're absolute enemies one with another. I can still see that one lady saying to the preacher, why don't you just die? Why don't you just die? We don't want you here. I kidded last week. Then one church, they passed around a, a deal that said, if you want the pastor to leave, sign here. The pastor signed it. <laughs> and actually, that was Jack Hiles that told that story uh, on himself when he first got to Hammond, Indiana. They learned what we do, we do together. Well, 
But it even goes further than just a church. It goes among Christianity. We're, we're, all, we're all the same. We're saved by the blood. Say amen. We're saved by the blood of the crucified one. We have eternal life. We have a heaven that we're waiting for. We have a local church to go to. Those are commonalities. That is a word. Common things between us. And yet, oftentimes, even within a church, you'll see, uh, well, here's one. This church holds to this Bible. It isn't up to you. And if you don't like it, that's your tough luck. This church only holds to the King James Bible. And yet I'll have people say to me, well, I use the others. And you have a right to do that. But you open a hole that one day you'll never be able to crawl out of. Because those other versions take out verses that are in here, especially about the blood. 21 verses. 407 other versions. How can you do that? Thousands of words that are made different and changed. And, and that, I try not, I'm doing it here a little bit. I just kind of dig in this some. Uh, I don't make it an issue. I don't get up and preach a King James Bible sermon. But you don't have a question in your mind, you shouldn't, that that's the only Bible I have. I would not open anything because they're not Bibles. They're versions. Don't you know that? They're versions of our Bible. And I don't have a King James Version. I have a King James Bible. We were here first. There was never another English Bible in America beside the King James until, of all things, uh, 1901. The first printed version was brought in, and it was rejected. No one touched it. Thirty-some years went by, and the people that had that figured out how to solve it. They put the professors in the Bible colleges who held their position. Honest truth. Thirty-five years later, they took those same 1901s, they were called, American Standard Versions. They took all the covers off of them, redid them, put new covers on, called them the New American Standard Version. The first one published and sold in bookstores, and it sold like pancakes. And now look at it today. You go in a bookstore and try to find this. This bookstore called me back and they said, hey, we found one for you. This is a, called the 17th edition. Uh, this is an old time King James Bible. They didn't even have one, a preacher's Bible. She said, uh, this is a hundred and some dollars, but somebody took it and when they brought it back, they cut out a page. And it was the one where you put down all of your relatives and everybody. And since it's cut out, we can't sell it over the counter, but we'll let you have it for $20. So I got my old time King James Bible, and you're not taking it away from me. Joyce, make sure that's in a casket with me. Between my hands, remember all the things you're going to do so that I can raise my finger, point at my Bible. She's going to have a string. She's going to put a smile on my face, but my King James Bible is going to be there. I, I don't make a, a big deal out of it, but... You need to understand it. Every Bible in this pew says King James. I used to say when we had a lot of people, I used to say if you don't have a King James with you today, you might want to put yours down and pick up the one in the pew because it'll be easier to follow me. And by the way, if you don't have a King James, you're welcome and you can take any one of those anytime you want. Give it to someone if you want. We have boxes of these that we'll put back in there we don't have to replace them anymore. Uh, all that to say this, shibboleth is a real issue among believers. It may not be the word shibboleth, but there are people that can't say it. They say shibboleth, and it costs 142,000. <laughs> oh, no, 40 and 2,000 of them. Uh, was that it? Yeah, 40 and 2,000 in their lives because they couldn't say this. Here, here's the outline. Now, all this is fun. Nobody gets killed over what I'm preaching on. But why do we need to be able to say shibboleth? Not the word, not the guacamole. Why, why do we need to know what we stand on? Here's the three points of the message. Uh, we are in need of a password. We need a common word that bonds us. And 
this shibboleth represents that. In our case, it's not just a word. It's, it's Baptist. It's who and what we are. We are old-time Bible-believing fundamental Baptists. I just taught uh, eight weeks in Sunday school on the acrostic of B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S -S and what those doctrines are. And it's what we are. And you can't afford to not know that. You can't afford to not believe that. There'll be a time when you'll come to a, ca a valley next to Jordan and you can't get through without being able to say those doctrines and stand on those doctrines. Or it may be you standing in the way asking of someone else, say shibboleth, the, the need for a password. Now here's number two. It answers the question, why not just let them go? What, why they came in why, and they were leaving, why don't we just let them go? There's a legitimate answer for that. And then the third one, what lesson do we really learn from this? Well, believe it or not, there is a good lesson here, and that's what I'll stop with at the end of the message. Father, didn't get a good start. I pray this somehow gets some understanding from it. This is important. This is really important. Who we are, what we are, where we are, what we stand for, what faith we have, it's not common. There are other people that claim it is so, but they don't stand in the same ground that we stand. And the danger for this church is when we don't take that stand, when we lose the ability to show who and what we are and stand for it without apology and without question. God, encourage our hearts with that truth today. And I'll thank you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, first of all, the need for a password, that's what this was. You couldn't get to the valley. I could almost picture Baptist. <laughs> I almost picture a guy standing there looking at you. You look like him. You're dressed like him. He's made it a point. He's got to get home, and he knows he can't get out of that, through that canyon to his valley if he can't say the right words. So he looks the part, he stands the part, and here you are looking across your glasses. Now, if I look across my glasses, you're not even there. <laughs> I can't see a thing. But you look at him and you say, say shibboleth. And the guy looks at you, and he's trying his best to frame the word, and he says, shibboleth. I <laughs> just that quick, he's run through, and he's put in the pile. The pile is 42,000 deep. Can you? I did get that right, did I? Forty and two thousand deep piled on the other side. For what reason? They couldn't say shibboleth. They said shibboleth, and it identified where they were from, and everything about where they were from told you what they were. Well, there are three things on this password. First of all, it needed a password, and now in this case, we don't have a word. We have the word. We have an old King James Bible. We have an old-time Baptist church. The, all of that put together identifies who and what we are. That's our password. I don't want to lose that. I don't want you to want me to lose that. We are a Baptist church. We stand on the truths of what old-time Baptists believe. We hold to this book. With what's going on in America, you're going to be... There are people in other countries that are governed like us where preachers are being arrested in the street for trying to go into their church and they're being thrown in jail saying you can't stand for that here. We've got nutcases in the White House and in the Congress who are trying to pass laws like that. They want to take away the First and Second Amendment. Where are you going to be? I'll tell you where you'll be. You'll be the only one that can say shibboleth. They'll hold the valley and they'll say, say thibboleth. And you won't be able to say it. Because just like guacamole, you, you, if you don't know the word, you won't be able to say the word. You have to be able to say the word. They look the same. <clears throat> Secondly, but they had a different view of service. They said to, uh, to our man here, uh, Japheth, they said to him, you went off and killed that whole crowd and you didn't invite us to come and join you? We're, we're, right now we're coming into your land. Oh, man. Do you, do you realize how many independent Baptist churches are infiltrated today with all kinds of people that if they were pushed would never take a stand? 
I don't ever want to be a Baptist preacher that won't teach this church that we take a stand. There are things you can't change here. There are things that we stand for, and you can have a different view on uh, <clears throat> on what you wear and you know, what you other things you do. But the things we stand for, when I got here, the music in this place would drive you crazy. Aren't you glad we have old time hymns to sing and a pianist that knows how to play them? And you're welcome that thing in my pocket if you need it on the way out. Uh, none, of, none of that's going to be changed. <clears throat> but I, real, <clears throat> I realize there are other churches that hold a different view. Saved, claim to be, pressing the difference, just as long as you're pressing it over there, not over here. The third thing, uh, what this does, their presence discourages the old time work of the ministry, the things that we do. Somebody would come along and say, well, I, I don't think we ought to be, especially with COVID, I don't, it'd be wrong for us to go to try knock on a door. Well, maybe it would with COVID, but COVID is gone. We're going to let the government make you think it's still here, but it's gone. And it's been gone longer than you think. And the fact is, even if it is there, our only responsibility would be to change the way we do it not to give up what we do. There isn't anything wrong with you taking a packet and hanging it on, don't go to the door, hang it at, at the gate. There's nothing wrong. You're not the one that'll get hit for that, I will. I get phone calls. You're, are you this guy, Judd Riley? Don't you stick your packet on my fence again, or I'll, and I, I'm on the phone, I'll have to say, or you will what? If you don't like it, throw it in the trash. He left it there, it would, and she left it there with good intentions. It'll tell you in there how to be saved, and man, you don't want to miss heaven. And that'll tell you, and most of the time I hear click. <laughs> but it starts out, we're going to come in, we're going to burn your houses. We, we just look for another way to get it done without a compromise. But what we can't afford to do is not do anything. You can't build a church by doing nothing. There has to be the ability of part, of part of God's people to present the gospel, to look the part, to speak the part, to be able to say shibboleth. Somebody out there can't say either one, and we want them to be able to say shibboleth, not thibboleth, with, your, with the T, thibboleth. Uh, the, the, the need here, and, and others end up, you can just by being wishy-washy is that a good that's not a good word just by not taking a stand you become a stand to yourself whereas the church says let's take a stand that going to church is important what would you do if i quit what would you do if i just came one service it might not be the service you come to or you'd be offended beyond your wildest dream. Well, how do you think I feel? Man, we need to build this church. And I don't want to have to make an apology for preaching what I'm preaching. Yeah, amen. What's the name of that stuff? I'm going to go home and kick, fix something that I remember. I want guacamole for a snack after service tonight. No, it's the second thing. The need for a password. Our password isn't shibboleth. It's Baptist, it's Bible, it's old time music played in the right way on our piano that glorifies the Lord. That's, the, that's our password. The second thing, it answers the question, why not just let them go? Well, two things here, can two work together except they be agreed? Would you write that down for memory verse? Write it down, Amos 3, 3. I'm giving you memory verse. And here's what it says. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos 3, 3. And that's slick, you just learned a memory verse. Why it's in Amos 3, 3, you'll have to see the context. But it's the truth. Churches thrive when they do things together. You know, the old expression, uh, the pastor, in this many cases, the pastor came up with an idea and I'm known among preachers as an idea preacher. I like to do things, and we've never been able to make a lot of them work around here. 
And then the key to it is, Pareto's principle, is to get a number of people to agree with you and to be excited about the same thing. Boy, it was so easy back in the day running three or four hundred. All I had to do is get a hundred people to nod their heads and shout amen while I'm presenting something we're going to do. And it's amazing how others caught on. You know, and uh, I was really expecting all kinds of, well, I'll leave the guacamole alone. I got left alone on the guacamole. So one person gets the idea, and a, and a number of people, say 10, 20 percent, grasp that idea. And here's how the slogan ends. And 80 percent don't even know there was an idea. <laughs> you you want to kill a church? Just do that. Somebody walks in and says, oh, we having a meeting? We're having a speaker today? I didn't know that. There'd never be a speaker in here you didn't hear about three to four weeks in advance. Oh, we're, uh, we're taking an offering for something? Uh, I had uh, one guy tell me, said, all you ever do is want to take offerings. <laughs> that made me feel bad because I, I, I'm giving you an opportunity, not commanding you to do something. And, and that's under one of those other slogans that we have. Uh, it's got to be a blessing and not a burden. That's what offerings are. Offerings are opportunities. The Zimmers, we, had, we set the five, we had another hundred come in. <laughs> so I've got to call him and say, look, we're going to send that in with your hundred support. We'll send that hundred along with that. So whoever you were, thank you for that hundred. And Zimmers get it. It's not going to be stuck off somewhere else. Uh, uh, why, why not, the answer is a question, why not, why not just let them go? That'll put them on the other side because can two walk together except they be agreed? They'd already done this twice before. This is the second time where Ephraim came to Gilead and said, you didn't call us and we're going to burn your houses. Now, how many times does somebody have to tell you that before you would take it on yourself to say, I need to put a stop to you now? That's why somebody walks in here, and, and, and I've had this happen. You would never hear this, except I would mention it. Uh, so, oh, and I'm running out. No, I guess I got, I got a little time. Uh, somebody comes in, and, and they make a non-doctrine defense. They say something to me about, well, why in the world would you preach that? Why wouldn't you? You know, and it happens once or twice. You don't know it, but I go to that individual. I go to their home, or I have them come in, or... I get them alone, take them in my office, say, look, you need to go find you another church. You can't come here. What do you mean I can't come here? You can't come here. We, what we do, we do together. And every time you walk in here, you're countering what I preach. Well, that's the other version say this. You never get away with that here. Only one time. And you leave. You don't have to agree totally with me but you have to agree with the fact I have the right and we have the right to take that position. And these people coming back and allowing them back shoots everything down. The idea is here, uh, can two walk together except they be agreed? Uh, and then the second thing will eventually, and that's the obvious one, they'll come back again. And that's what made this so dramatic. This is why uh, Jephthah said, don't let them out. We, we, there's only one way they can get back home and that's through this valley and they're not going to go out of here having come in here trying to burn our houses you know it's kind of drastic I know but it answers the question why not just let it go because it's going to show up again and there are churches all around us today that are being infiltrated by non-baptists let's make it more pointed by say for example Pentecostalism you say, preacher, what would be wrong with that, shibboleth? We don't speak in tongues here. We don't believe you can lose your salvation. Don't you know? You say, well, I used to be a Pentecostal. Well, you weren't a very good one because a Pentecostal knows that you can lose your salvation. And a Baptist knows you can't. And you're in a Baptist church. And as long as you're here, you can't lose it. But if you leave, no, <laughs> that was a joke. That was a guacamole joke. Uh, you, to stand on the truth and to know the truth. The Bible said you shall know the truth and the truth will, truth will set you free. Here's number three. Why, why say shibboleth? Why have a shibboleth? Because there needs to be a password. 
There needs to be, do you know all the things we stand on? Uh, let, me, let me show you how you fix that real quick. You're questioning whether, Pastor, I maybe said something today that was a little offensive to you. Put it on the card. You have to be there to hear me answer it. Then come and, and, and I'll answer the question. Ask and somebody will give you the answer. You can ask other people. We're, we're not hiding anything that we do here. There's nothing I do here and have ever done here that would embarrass the Lord. And I know that deep in my heart. The, the need of a password, uh, the, it answers the question, why not just let them go? The, the shibboleth answers that question because they can't say it. And if they don't fit the doctrine, a church is all about doctrine. And, and you have to be comfortable. Please, you have to be comfortable to know that in my 53 years of preaching, I've never once ever taught a false doctrine. I've never been accused of preaching. Well, I did have a guy walk out of Sunday school here a while back, a couple of years ago. And as I walked out the door, he said, what you just taught was not right. I turned around to him. I said, in my office. We went in my office and had a talk about it. You can't say that here unless you have a verse. You have to be able to go to a verse and say, preacher, that's wrong. And by the way, if you could do that, I would have resigned the next Sunday. I wouldn't have a right to be the pastor of the church. But not I do this for a living. I do this for a living. Don't notice the third one. Well, what, what lesson did we learn from seeing this? It's drastic, but you have to be able to say shibboleth. Well, what lesson did we learn? First of all, our strength is in us. And that was the slogan I used earlier. What we do, we do together. And you know how to say shibboleth. You hear shibboleth from this pulpit every Sunday. Clear cut, right in line, exactly what the Lord told us to say. And, and I run with men who do the same thing. We have good fellowship together because we don't have arguments. And the key word is the word doctrine. I've got people today that try to play down doctrine. You can't play down doctrine. Doctrine is what we are. It's what makes us who we are. And, and we have to stay strong, and it's for us. And then secondly, and I'm almost done, all of our servants should be easily to identify because we can all say shibboleth. <laughs> With my false teeth, I almost mispronounced it. Shibboleth. Uh, it, it's a common denominator among us. It's who we are, and it's what we are. And I'm comfortable with that. I'll never have to worry about David and Sandra getting up singing something that's going to embarrass us. I don't have to worry about Ruby getting up and playing something that came out of a high church or a new evangelical church or whatever kind of church, because she wouldn't get halfway through that. She'd look over and see the preacher going. She never got by with it because of the husband she had, whose name was Billy. Billy knew what the right music was, and he married the lady that knew that music. Uh, we're easily identified. You ought to, now I'm preaching kind of hard in these areas, but it's, it's, it isn't offending you. You want a pastor that takes a stand. Man, if you don't, then let me know. I, you know, I, I'm getting old anyway. But I, man, I want to preach the truth and stand for the truth. And, I want you to believe the truth. Uh, the third thing, and I'll close, uh, too long away from us will change your language. You go to my daughter, my son raised in Colorado, and we go down there to visit them where they come up here, and they talk. My son talks like Floridians. My daughter talks like a Georgian, and they really put it off on my children. And I can laugh about that because we're all Americans. And, they speak their way and we speak ours. We'll say a word and I, I'll say the icebox. I've just said it all my life. Uh, well, go look in the icebox. One of my grandkids looked at me and said, Grandpa, what's an icebox? <laughs> Oops. In, in my day, you, you put the ice in the top, picked it up and put it in there when they delivered it to your house. Now it's a fridge. I can't even say fridge. It sounds silly. Go check the fridge. Well, anyway, I'll they speak a little different. But if you get too long away, just try it. 
Get away from this old book. Start checking other versions. And you're the ones going to be uncomfortable, not me. And you're going to end up in a position where you say, Pastor, I read this different than what you said. Say shibboleth. Say shibboleth. The, the longer you're away from it, the harder it is to say it. And they could never say it. Let's, let's, stay, let's stay with the shibboleth. It's our, and I, you know what I, I hope you know guacamole. I hope you know what I'm saying. Th- this is our shibboleth. Th- this is our shibboleth. Here's one. I'm your shibbolether. <laughs> is that a word? I'm your shibbolether. I'm the one that teaches shibboleth. And boy, when I got my false teeth, I had to practice saying it again. It'd be easier to say thibboleth <laughs> with, with, the, with your false teeth. Uh, what we do, we do together. We stand together on the Word of God, and we're comfortable with each other. We're comfortable with the groups we run with and what they believe. And right now, Pentecostalism is reviving itself. You're told in the Bible three things in the last days, and one of them is that. Uh, and I don't, I don't have that verse in front of me. The things that they'll change in the last days, and one of them has to do with the Word of God. And that's totally different. They don't teach eternal security. They, they believe you have to speak in tongues in order to be saved. I have a hard enough time speaking English. Not worried about speaking in tongues. We don't speak in tongues. Say shibboleth. You can say that. You don't speak in tongues, I'll guarantee you. Stand by this stuff. Look at it one time and I'll close. And verse 6, And they said unto him, Say now shibboleth. And he said shibboleth. Now underline it. For he could not frame to pronounce it right. He had said it so long that he had to say pack the car. We've said it so long we parked the car. We've said it so long we'll say pass the guacamole. We, you know, somebody else will say pass the guacamole. How can anybody get guacamole out of the word guacamole? <laughs> and so pick a bunch of words like that and then kind of let that identify We're just old-time fundamental Baptists, and I close with this. Say shibboleth. Say shibboleth. I I think I heard thibboleth. Nah, it couldn't be. Not in a good old fundamental Baptist church. Father, thank you for fundamental Baptists, for fundamental believers. A lot of them aren't Baptists. I don't know why they wouldn't want to be. But there are a lot of people that believe the truth and hold to the truth. They would die for the truth. And that's the purpose of this message today. To be able to say shibboleth costs us a lot. To be able to say shibboleth speaks of who we are and what we do. To be able to say shibboleth is a comfort to others who can pronounce it as well. And Lord, I know it's a play on words, but as long as we stand, might we clearly say shibboleth. I'll thank thee in Jesus' name. Take your hymnals and turn to page number 276. 276. Shame on me, I didn't preach any gospel in a gospel message, but I wanted to preach say shibboleth. Hope you enjoyed it. Couple verses. This goes with the message. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. 
leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. We'll quit there, that's the idea. We'll stand by the stuff and be faithful to the Lord. Sure would love to see you tonight if you're able to be here. Uh, the title of that message was uh, The Grace of God. There are four kinds of grace in your Bible, and I want to show you all four of them. They all point to the same thing. I think you'll enjoy the message. So join us at 545 for the evening service. Give me a minute to get to the door.